first things first, I am not what you call the stereotypical prepper. I don't own my own home, I don't have several years worth of food stashed away in my closet or basement, and I certainly don't have an arsenal that could take on a small American dictatorship. What I do have are tools that would make my life a little easier should a natural disaster make my home unlivable. The general consensus of the American prepper is rooted in this one simple act, self-reliance. What self-reliance is, is basically taking charge of your own well-being. For example, you will have a vegetable garden to provide your own vegetables instead of relying on grocers who may get their produce from growers who use toxic chemicals and pesticides. You will have solar panels or a wind turbine to help cut down on the amount of energy you use from the power grid. Or if the grid should ever go down, you are not relying upon the grid for your total power needs. One more, you can use rain barrels to collect rainwater to water your garden, lawn, or if there was a water main break, you could have water already on hand to cook and clean with. And the list can go on and on from here, but these are the basic ideas. You do not rely on somebody else or some organization to come bail you out when bad things happen. What about insurance, you might ask? Isn't that an organization designed to bail you out? Not quite. You see, an insurance company is a non-tax gambling agency. They look at you, where you live, and how you live, and calculate odds from existing data on what kinds of accidents or disasters you might have. For example, if you have a house in a flood zone, you will have very high flood insurance premiums. Or the ability to have flood insurance will not exist due to the high odds of a flood actually happening. Insurance companies are for-profit entities, meaning that they have to make a profit to appease their shareholders and any time they have to pay out, they will fight tooth and nail or drag their heels on issuing a check so you can rebuild your life. The greatest of these offenders are health insurance companies, but I will not go on that very sore subject. FEMA, or the Federal Emergency Management Agency, has been advising Americans to prepare a 72-hour kit with basic necessities should a disaster strike. The reasoning behind the 72-hour kit is to make you self-reliant for at least 72 hours until responders can get to you or when services can be restored. Like I said before, government agencies take forever, and it may take days, weeks, or longer to get your life back on track. Now, there's been a lot of hype about these things lately. I'm talking about the bug out bag, or Bob for short. People call these things by different names, like their get out of dodge bag, get home bag, the inch or I'm never coming home bag, my personal favorite, the zombie apocalypse bag. Whatever you want to call it, its simple purpose is to provide you the means of survival for a period of time until help arrives. Unless you think that help wouldn't arrive, then a bob will be the last thing on your mind. Now let's take a pause for a minute to examine why exactly you will need a bob. As was mentioned before, FEMA uses the example of natural disasters, whether it be volcanic, wildfires, earthquakes, hurricanes, tornadoes, I could go on and on, but you get the idea, natural disasters. However, there could be disasters caused by humans such as riots or civil unrest, economic meltdown, a hostile government, war, industrial accidents, nuclear meltdowns, and, well, you get the idea. The concept of a bob should not be limited to the Americas. Practically anyone in the world can benefit to having one simple kit or bag ready in case all hell decides to break loose. However, in building a bob, you should have one important thing. Knowledge. Education is the single most important thing to constructing anything, especially something that will possibly save your life. Now, like anything, the quality of what you get will determine the quality of the end result. Like the old saying goes, garbage in, garbage out. One more thing you must take in consideration is that your situation may be different than someone else's and your gear or items you put in your bob may not benefit someone else. For example, if you live in a more tropical climate, you have no need for snowshoes or a heavy parka, while someone in the Arctic has no use for bug spray and flip-flops. Education is key. You can start with the ever-popular internet, but as opinionated, commercialized, and in some areas seedy, finding a good source is a challenge. Getting your information from television is not the wisest idea, because oftentimes the events or information is staged or geared to sell you a product. 
like that science report you wrote in the eighth grade. Resource different avenues and get different viewpoints before you find the exact information you need. With that being said, I found several books to help me out in constructing my Bob. The first is When All Hell Breaks Loose by Cody Lundeen. Second is When There's No Doctor by Gerard S. Doyle, M.D. SAS Survival Handbook by John Lofty Wiseman. 98.6 Degrees, The Art of Keeping Your Ass Alive, again by Cody Lundeen. The U.S. Army Survival Guide. And lastly, The Zombie Survival Guide by Max Brooks. Laugh all you want about the last book, I was recommended this book by several acquaintances still serving in the military. The reasoning behind it is it deals with an urban setting, it explains in better detail about escape, evasion, as well as choke points for an ambush. The zombie stuff, just pay it no mind unless you like that kind of stuff. In the book, When All Hell Breaks Loose and in 98.6 Degrees, Lundin explains that your survival depends on maintaining a constant body temperature and that most deaths in the outdoors happen by either hypothermia, getting too cold, or hyperthermia, getting too hot. It is the simple principle of maintaining perfect homeostasis of your body that is essential to staying alive, and there are the deadly rules of three that equate to this. Exposure, three hours. Water, three days. Food, three weeks. Now different conditions may hasten or prolong these timetables, but it's a general rule that these are paramount to importance. To prevent exposure, shelter is your best option, which can and does include clothing. After all, you need to regulate your body temperature, right? Water is almost everywhere on Earth, but drinkable water is another story, and having a way to make water safe to drink is a challenge if not impossible without the right tools. The same will go with food. Unless you are able to catch fish with your bare hands every time, or you know exactly what wild plants are safe to eat, you will need to bring along as well as have the ability to obtain food as time progresses. One more thing that is needed in some form or another is a first aid kit. Infection can take you out and make it a very painful death. Even from an infected scrape or splinter can bring you down. Now that we have the important stuff to consider, we need to look at how to construct the bob or emergency kit and keep these factors in mind when doing so. 1. In an emergency you will not think clearly. While under stress it can and does make judgment and find motor skills difficult. The kit must be simple and have the absolute necessary items to keep you alive. 2. It must be mobile or have the ability to carry it long distances. If you are forced to board evacuation trucks or public transportation, you might be only able to take one bag. 3. There is no one-size-fits-all. Your needs or situation may be vastly different from someone else, but make sure you pack the essential items for sustaining life. Shelter, water, food, first aid. 4. How you pack your items is important. You don't want to dig down to the bottom of your bag for a band-aid or pull everything out for a rain cover and in the process get everything wet and defeating the purpose of having the rain cover in the first place. 5. Try to have items in your kit to have multiple uses. The less you have to pack, the less space and weight your pack has. Unfortunately, some items may only have one use or purpose, but try to find other uses for that item you pack anyway. 6. The rule Two is one, one is none. For a tool that is essential, like a flashlight or a knife, have a backup in case you lose or break that item, you'll have a spare. 7. Keep it organized. For example, you don't want to dig for your tinder in one part of your bag while your lighter or matches are in another part of your bag. Remember, in an emergency, you'll be under a lot of stress and clear thinking will not be available. Now that we have the basic concepts of what to look for and how to organize it, let's actually look into the core items and what categories they fall under. Remember, if you have items that have multiple purposes, that's a good thing, even if it crosses over to different categories. Starting with the most deadly obstacle to your continued existence, let's look at exposure. To prevent exposure, you need shelter or a way to keep you warm in cooler temperatures. Remember, maintain your body temperature. One clothing. This is the closest to your body and will do an okay job at retaining body heat if you use it in layers. Or in warmer climates it will protect you from the heat in the sun's rays. 2. Shelter. 
a tarp or any kind of covering to keep precipitation or intense sunlight off of you. If you have the ability of taking along a tent, then that's an extra bonus. 3. Fire or any other kind of heat source. Clothing and shelter can only go so far. You will need an external heat source to keep you warm. Even in the desert, the temperature will drop drastically at night. Water is life, and that's no joke. Your body is mostly made of water. In the books by Cody Lundeen, he has entire chapters dedicated to it. I guess living in a desert, you appreciate the stuff a little more. But anyway, once you find a water source, you will need a way to make it drinkable. Otherwise, it will make you very sick. Third world countries still have high death rates due to the lack of clean drinking water. Also, if you happen to be in a snowstorm, or there's a lot of snow and ice around you, don't think you can eat it and get your water fix. Eating ice or snow will give you water only after your body melts it, which in turn will drop your body temperature and eventually make you dead. Plus, remember the golden rule about snow, don't eat yellow snow. It may make for a good laugh as a kid, however you have to keep in mind that unless you caught the snow as it fell, picking up snow from the ground may have deadly bacteria from animal waste floating on the top couple of inches. I'll skip ways to obtain water for another time or leave it with the experts. I'll just stick with what you do with it once you have it. Now that you have your water, you need a way to make it safe to drink. The easiest are these three. 1. Pasteurization Or another way to put it, boil your water. 2. Filtration A water filter that can remove the bacteria, protozoa, and other microscopic nasties. 3. Chemical there are tablets and drops out there that will do the job, but the most common chemicals are tincture of iodine 2% and chlorine bleach. Once you have a safe drinking water, you need a way to store and carry it. You can use canteens, clean plastic milk jugs, soda bottles, or even reuse empty water bottles. As long as the container you have is or was used for containing drinkable fluids, anything goes and your imagination is the limit. When it comes to food, the average American could definitely afford to skip a meal, or two, or three, but eventually you will need to feed your brain the necessary sugars it needs to function. You will eventually need food. You can, and a number of people are decently effective in gathering food in the wild, but you should have some necessary staples on hand when the line, trap, or whatever you use comes up empty. If you remember from elementary school, eat balanced meals. This may be a little hard to do in the wild or emergency situations. Just eat something that has some nutrition. Candy, cookies, or any other junk food is just that. Junk. Foods that are high in salt or sodium will drain you of precious water that you will still need to digest food. But salty foods are a bad idea if water is scarce. Do you know that it takes about a quart of water to digest a granola bar? And more water is required to digest meats or proteins. If water is pretty much not a problem, you can go with the following rations to get you through. 1. Canned foods. These are really heavy and take up a lot of space. However, they do have a decent shelf life, and if you have canned vegetables, they contain their own water source, saving you precious water reserves. If you do pack canned goods, use these up first. 2. MREs. These stand for Meals Ready to Eat, a staple of the U.S. military out in the field. The surplus MREs will contain a heater element that needs water to activate. These are great, but they take a little more space and weight than the next items. 3. Dehydrated Meals The most popular of these are Mountain House and Wise brands, and you can find them in most larger sporting goods stores. In fact, dry beans, rice, instant oatmeal, and pasta can be considered as dehydrated foods if you are on a limited budget. 4. Emergency Ration Bars Several companies mostly make these for lifeboats, but since the prepper movement has gained momentum, they are selling these to the general public. The bars look and feel like a brick, and are measured in k-calories, or thousands of calories. The average adult in full daily exertion will burn 2,000 calories a day easy, just for a little reference. Lastly is first aid and the rules of three. First aid is not listed, and for a good point. You can survive for a while without applying band-aids or wrapping yourself up in gauze if you don't need it. However, first aid will be necessary at some point, and a basic kit is better than nothing when you need it. Typically, the most common items in any first aid kit are 1. Bandages Either self-adhesing or gauze pads that need tape to adhere the wound area as well as different sizes. 2. Pain relievers 
These could be generic aspirin tablets or high-potent prescription painkillers. You need something to relieve the pain or reduce swelling in joints or tendons if too much exertion is the cause. Also, if you are in pain, a good rest is almost impossible. 3. Antiseptic ointments. If you get a cut or scrape, you don't want that to get infected. 4. Anti-diarrhea medicine. Drinking funky water or sometimes excessive stress will cause the toilet two-step. Diarrhea robs you of water and must be stopped fast. 5. Anti-itch medicine. If you get a bug bite, rash, or anything else that causes the skin to become inflamed, it could lead to infection, and that's bad. There will be arguments about what all to put in your medical kit, and some people are all about the physical health of a person. That's great and all, but the average person will not need a suture kit to fix a simple cut. Plus, how many people know how to suture up human flesh and know what they are doing? You can have your first aid kit as elaborate as you want as long as you at least cover the basics. Your body has had millions of years to perfect ways to repair itself, but it takes time and the right environment to do so. So, if you have a blister on your foot and you don't have mole skin or medical tape, just take it easy with the walking or take a day or two to rest and let the thing heal up a bit. Just use common sense. Now that we have our basics, we need a container to put them in. Remember when I said mobile? The easiest is a backpack, one large enough to fit all items you will need and have the ability to gain access to the items easily. If you can't get or obtain a backpack, a suitcase or a tote with wheels will suffice until you can get a pack that you can carry on your back. A duffel bag or any other bag that you have to carry will get heavy after a couple of miles of hiking, and the urge to drop it and keep walking will be great. Another way is a blanket or a piece of cloth. Remember the iconic picture of the hobo with a handkerchief bundle tied to a stick? So in short, a backpack that is large enough to carry all your necessities, but light enough to be comfortable is the key. If money is a concern, you can go to thrift, closeout, and secondhand stores. Garage sales are a possibility, but I personally wouldn't count on finding one there. Another way is military surplus outlets. Most of the time the gear is used, but still serviceable. Or if you ask, you might be able to find new packs if the military is changing styles or going with a different camo pattern. Case in point, the U.S. military used to use the Alice pack for decades until they switched over to the Molly system. A lot of backpackers and preppers swear by Alice. You can find new packs, but they are getting harder to find. Molly, on the other hand, is relatively easy to find, and with the influx of military personnel returning from the conflicts in the Middle East, you have your choice of new or used. If money is no object, you can go with the top-of-the-line mountaineering backpacks. These will set you back a good couple hundred bucks, but they will have the room and they will be constructed of durable materials, unlike the packs in the thrift stores. Whatever you choose, choose wisely. However, you do have the ability to upgrade at a later time when conditions allow it. One more thing to think about is that your bag has to be water-resistant or waterproof to some degree. Don't expect to use your pack as a flotation device. Just have the ability to keep your stuff dry as best as possible. Organization is important. As was said before, you don't want to dig around looking for something if you need it right away. The easiest way is to have smaller bags or pouches containing different themed kits, like first aid kit, fire starting, food, and so on. The easiest way is to use Ziploc freezer bags. They are durable enough to a point, and they are designed to keep water out or in, depending on the situation. Plus, they are clear and you can see exactly what's inside. That's pretty much it for what a bob is supposed to be and what its overall intended purpose is. There will be arguments for a more detailed purpose and exactly what should be in it, but I just want to cover the very generics here. I do suggest picking up the books mentioned before. There is a ton of useful information that I didn't cover here. Keep in mind that the building of a bob should not take over your daily life. It's just another form of an insurance policy. Whatever you do purchase or make will be important in saving your as well as your family's skin. So don't use junk. Take time and ask yourself, am I going to trust my or my family's life with this blank? You don't have to spend a lot of money for the gear. Just make sure it's sturdy enough. Thank you and have a good day.